thank you, Costas, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's um, my second time in Thessaloniki. I came uh, to Greece about 15 years ago to an uh, NSIP conference that Yanis uh, 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 had, had organized uh, in a location very close by, and I, I stopped by in, in Thessaloniki. So it, it is a pleasure to come, to come back here, and thank you for the hospitality and the invitation. Uh, I will talk about compressive uh, spectral imaging. Compressive sensing is a is an area that has received a lot of attention recently, and my work uh, entails of how to apply that theory to an area of spectral imaging. Uh, spectral imaging is uh, of interest uh, to the DOD, to the Department of Defense, because they're looking at targets, and targets have very distinct spectral signatures. Uh, some targets may have some spectral signature during this day, and they may have a different signature in a different time of the day, and, and so on. It is also used in, the, in, in, medi in biomedicine. Uh, you have uh, tissue spectral signatures are of, of key importance in to, to see diseases and, and the like. So it is a, it's, a, it's an interesting area. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on compressive sensing in case you have never heard of this. Um, so I will be talking about the first part is uh, in a nutshell what compressive sensing is, and then I will uh, dive into um, what we're doing in compressive uh, spectral imaging, and then uh, some uh, emerging tools that are coming out in low rank uh, recovery on on uh, applied to spectral imaging. <coughs> So compressive sensing uh, deals with the problem of uh, signal acquisition. Typically, when when you acquire a signal, uh, you you have an image and you're going to sample this image at a say n by n or an Nyquist rate, right? So you have a lot of data that you capture, but when you're doing something with it, like co communicating or storing it, or just about any any application at hand, you're going to compress it. So you're going to compress that, and then you're going to transmit. So we're using the Nyquist sampling rate here, but it's it's really not very good, as, as we shall see. It's not what well we had learned in, in all our undergraduate, uh, uh, undergraduate years that the Nyquist sampling rate is, is low and that we have to do that. Surprisingly, it's there's some signals by which you, you don't have to sample at the Nyquist rate. Right, so compressive sensing tells you, you know, why do we have to sample this very, very finely, doing a lot of work, doing a lot of work in some sort of tree coding or, or JPEG 2000 coding, to then a way to throw away a lot of that data. There's no need to do that. <coughs> so uh, compressive sensing gives you a way to uh, overcome that, uh, that strategy and have another, another strategy. And the real, the real motivation is that a lot of signals that are being acquired it is, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work. You have spectral imaging, as we, s we shall see, you have very high resolution, and you have many, many, many bands. You have med medical imaging, where you have a very high resolution image on a, on a slice, and then you take many, many slices and the like. And there are many examples where the data has just become massive. And are there ways to simplify the problem? Donahoe, Candice, Romberg, and Tao are the fellows uh, that uh, came and um, sort of uh, discovered all of this uh, area in, in compressive sensing. And they revealed that the minimum number of samples to reconstruct a signal depends on its sparsity, not necessarily its bandwidth. So Nyquist had this idea that you, know, you have to sample twice as much as the bandwidth. Bandwidth uh, was the key parameter, the key issue there. Well, it turns out the sparsity is the, the fundamental um, property of signals that, that will determine how much you have to sample. So, so we will see that uh, uh, how sparsity comes into into play. So, how what what is sparsity, right? What is when is a signal sparsity? If you have a signal here, x. And we say a signal is sparse if you have some basis representation. It could be the discrete cosine transform. It could be the wavelet transform. Some, some basis of expansion. And you have some coefficients here that are going to represent your signal. 
then sparsity means that you only need a few of these elements that are non-zero that you're going to multiply by those bases that are going to represent your signal. Right, and that's exactly what you have in, 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 say, this image here. You have this image that look like that. And you only have a very few coefficients here. You have only, you know, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, there's some very few coefficients that are non-zero or significant that will need, you will need to represent that image. So that's a very sparse uh, signal. So that's, that's the whole, the whole um, scenario. We have many signals that are sparse in nature in that uh, you only need a few coefficients to represent uh, the signal almost exactly. And the examples are, are many. You, you have video, you have imagery, you have sound, speech, etc. There's many, many signals that, that occur in, in nature. Something that will happen is um, when we try to measure sparsity, uh, it's, uh, sparsity is measured with the L0 norm. The L0 is you count the number of non-zero elements on a vector. Right? So that's the L0 norm. It turns out that the L1 norm can also be used to, uh, to count sparsity. Uh, and the L1 norm is um, just the sum of the absolute value of the, of the, of the vector. The L2 norm that is typically used in, in uh, signal processing is not what we should be using uh, for representing or, or measuring sparsity. And I'll show you in a, in a second why that is. So the L0 and the L1 norm are, are good for sparsity. And this is one, one um, example. Suppose you have this, this vector. It's 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. It's just one element of 1. Everything else is 0. Called a spike signal, or you have this signal that's one over n, one over n, the whole thing, not sparse at all. Right? You would agree that you, know, you have elements there everywhere. So if you take the L2 norm of these two vectors, the L2 norm of x1 is one, and the L2 norm of the x2 is also one. So they have the exact same norm, L2 norm, even though they have very different sparsity characteristics. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you take the L1 norm, right, you have x1, the L1 norm of x1 is 1, and the L1 norm of this small vector here is the square root of n. So much larger, uh, which sort what we want to show, right? That the L1 norm here gives you a much bigger uh, saying that it's not, not very sparse. And this is just a diagram telling you that if you take the L2 norm, all of these all of these green areas here are, are going to have the same L2 norm. So this, in the two-dimensional vector, this point and that point, they have the same L2 norm. Whereas in the L1, uh, you have this type of the L1 ball, what they call it. And that's critical in, in the compressive sensing because you need, you're going to use L1 norms to, 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 to process. OK, so if we don't take samples like the Nyquist, right? in the Nyquist you took periodic samples, right, of, of, of the signal. Compressive sensing takes samples in a very distinct way, completely different. What you do here is you're going to take samples of inner product. So suppose this, is, this, suppose this is the signal, this is x, that you're trying to measure. Then what you're going to do is you're going to project this, pr this vector into some sort of random uh, Another random vector. You're going to do the inner product of this signal that, you're, that interests you with, an, with a random vector. And that's going to be your first measurement, y. So that's y1. Take the same vector x. You take it with another random realization. That's y2, and so on. So you take m measurements to represent this signal x. So the idea is here you have a x that you're interested in. It's very long. This is very n long, n long, but you're only taking m measurements, and m is much smaller than n. And that's the neat thing. You can compress your measurements. Right? Something that would, you're trying to represent something that's very, very big, and taking only a very few measurements, m. Right. So this is the the random uh, matrix projection operator that, that is uh, is used here. I should note something that in this case I'm showing just the sparsity of x uh, in time. 
but the sparsity could be in another domain, could be frequency, right? So here, x doesn't necessarily have to be sparse in its in, in, in its representation. Here, this could be multiplied by another um, basic representation, maybe the wavelet domain representation, and some coefficients there. So this is just a simplified version of the of the problem. <coughs> Does everybody see this? This is this is critical. This is very, very important that uh, you know that this is well understood. Are there any any questions? That my uh, anything not clear here? Everything everything clear? Okay. So there are very cri critical things to to look at. X is n long, right? This is random. X can be a signal sparse in different representations, could be wavelet or DCT. And then you have M measurements. So the things that need to be designed or uh, looked into are how many measurements do we really need? That's sort of like the Nyquist rate, you know, how many samples do we need? That's M. How is it related to the sparsity of the signal? And how do you design this random matrix, if you will? So those are all questions that are very important in compressive sensing, and we will we will talk about some of these things. This is an example that tells you that just taking the pseudo inverse of this problem. Suppose if you just took these measurements, this is x, this is a linear operator, this matrix A, this random matrix A, you have y. If you know this, you could take the pseudo inverse of this matrix, multiply by y, and try to get x. Right. Well, if you do that, you're doing L2 processing. This is what happens. This is the original sparse signal. You have, uh, you know, you have 400, and some, 400 samples. You took, uh, I can't remember the numbers, 100 and something samples. You, you compress. You know, this is the projection. This is the, how you're measuring this signal. And if you try to reconstruct this signal from here, this is what you get with the least squares, the pseudo inverse. Garbage, right? You don't, you don't, you're not even close to getting this. And the reason is because here you're doing everything on L2 processing. You're doing the L2 norms. <coughs> Another thing that's very important is that these random matrices that, that you have, you have these, remember that random matrix that we have that we were projecting? They have to be sort of incoherent with your basis representation of your signal. So if you're if you are if you have an image which is very sparsely represented with a wavelet, then those random sort of um, a random matrix doesn't have to resemble cannot resemble the wavelets. Right. So this is sort of like an, a mutual incoherence principle. And this is sort of what, what tells you. If this is your signal that you're trying to sample with compressive sensing. Those random matrices have to be something that look completely different than this. You can make those random, like binary random. You, you can make them. Or you can make them Gaussian random. That would work. But in essence, they have to be very, very different than, than the signal that you're, you're trying to acquire. Right, so the um, the way to do this, and we're we're not gonna go into the mathematics of how you do the reconstruction because I want to spend more time on the com compressive uh, spectral imaging. Uh, but there are many ways to do the reconstruction. There's uh, regularization formulation. There's greedy uh, approaches, Bayesian approaches, and all of them, in essence, are are doing an L1 regularization. You do an L2 data fitting in an L2 uh, regularization. But we're not, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that today. We're going to jump into how do we use this in compressive uh, spectral imaging, right? Because let me just comment something. In the area of compressive sensing, this is x. This is your random projection. This is y. The really difficult thing in compressive sensing is finding devices that do this operation. That you have the signal that you're trying to acquire, and that you're going to multiply by a matrix, a random matrix, to capture your, your signal Y. This operation here is non-trivial. 
Right? I mean, you, you don't want to do a, you don't want to do Nyquist sampling of X, do your projection in a digital domain to get a digital representation. I mean, you can do that, but that's sort of cheating. Right? That's a, you, that's not, that's all you want to do. It turns out that in spectral and imaging, in spectral imaging, this is done in a very beautiful, natural way. And that's something that's uh, very, very natural to do to do compressive sensing in, in spectral imaging. Right. So what the, here we're we're trying to get the spatial impro information across a broad spectrum. And then, as I mentioned, we have surveillance applications, remote sensing, spectroscopy in medicine as applications of interest. Uh, this is a, a device that has been built to prove this concept. Um, David Brady at Duke and his team, and there are some uh, uh, faculty member here uh, that works in, in this area as well. Um, but they built this, this um this device for the spectral imaging that I will describe. And then I'll tell you what we're doing uh, on the system. The system works in a very simple way. This is your scene. And this is we're trying to, to take a spectral image uh, shot, if you will. You, took, you take a lens, and you put a code aperture. This is nothing more than a slide. Uh, where you have zeros and ones. You relay this, and you put through a prism. You put that light through a prism, or a dispersive element. It's just going to shift the spectrum. And then you just capture this with a CCD array. And I'll explain this to you. And rather than go through the equations, etc., I'll, I'll show it to you in a very intuitive, simple way. This is a. Um, this is a, a measurement. This is the, an original image. This is what you're going to measure with this system. And this is how you're going to reconstruct different areas of, of the scene. Right? So you, at this wavelength, I get this. At this other wavelength, I get that, and so on. You, you go through, the, through all the um, uh, spectral channels between 540 to 640 nanometers. <coughs> this is a simulation of how it works. A little more intuitive. Suppose you have a, a color image. This is RGB. How the CCD array would measure, the CCD would look in and it, it would measure this. There's no color information. Well, the color information is embedded, but it's embedded in the amplitude here. Based on these measurements, I can reconstruct each of the RGB components and get the reconstructed image. Right, this is, so of course, in color, you would not use uh, spectral imaging. You would, you would use... Uh, R RGB uh, CCD arrays, but just as this is just an illustration of how, how you would, if you just only have three channels, this is what spectral imaging would look like. So how does this work? Let's see. Let's see. It's very very interesting. This is a code aperture, you know, just a slide that it blocks some of the light and it doesn't block some parts of the other light. Right? This is like a slide. And you, you can think of it as a random uh, on and off. Uh, pieces, blocks of this uh, in here. And suppose this is the image cube. This is x dimension, this is the y dimension, and this is the spectral dimension, this is the wavelength. Now suppose you have only information in one uh, spatial point. So you have x and y are here, but you have two, uh, two bands. You have this green and this blue band in a single pixel. So this whole image consists of a single pixel, and that sing single pixel has this co component, this green and this blue. So what happens, if, it, if, if it's on and the color aperture lets it through, the prism will shift s the blue or, or the green light more than the blue light. So the blue component will go here, the, the, the green will go there, and the CCD array would capture that single pixel into two pixels. And that's what it measures, the intensity in here of this blue and this green. It's not measuring color. It's just measuring intensity. So you're coding the wavelength and intensity into spatial shifting and 
on the CCD array. Right? So let me give you another another example. In here you have uh, one spectral band. You don't have different spectral bands. You only have uh, a line. You know, you have a line in in uh, x and y, and uh, only one spectral band. So what that happens? It goes through the coded aperture. Some of it lets go through. Some of it stopped. So what you measure is this. So there's no, there hasn't been any any shearing of the spectrum. You only have the coded apertures that have been applied to this to this signal. Here you start seeing the compressive sensing nature of this. Suppose you have you know, a pixel with many spectral bands, and then you have another pixel next to it. Then if you do the coding, different bands get shifted different ways, and under the detector, things are going to start overlapping. Right? So for instance, here, this, this yellow component and the blue component here, they add it together. <coughs> and this is the this is what the CCD array measures. That's where the compressive sensing comes into play because you're measuring linear projection. You're measuring sums of of pix pixels in this cube. Right. This is just a an example where you have you know, m more and more superpositions, and when you have um, when you have a Different rows. But this is interesting that one slice is completely independent of another slice. This is the row I. It gets processed like this, but this other row gets processed separately. They're they're independent. Um, so this is what happens. You have a full cube. You have a complete data cube. It goes to the to the code aperture in here. It gets sh sheared by the prism. And then everything gets added up together. And that's your compressive measure. So based on this, then you're able to reconstruct a cube almost perfectly. And that's the real beauty of, of this system. Right, that's, a, that's an example of a that reconstruct al algorithm that we use, the L1 LS algorithm. So <coughs> <coughs> Right, so this is the, the system that uh, these guys at Duke did. But the Navy came to us and said, we're interested not in reconstructing the whole cube, because this is, it takes too much time. It's very complicated. We would like to get bands, say, A, B, and F. We don't, we don't care the other, about the other bands, because the signatures of the, of the targets are important only in those frequency bands. And the work, the, the project we're working on is generalizing this spectral imaging system, by which I can I can only measure those bands and reconstruct the bands of interest to the Navy. Right. And uh, so what we're going to be doing is rather than having a single c uh, code aperture pattern, I'm going to have something that changes. I'm going to have a spatial light modulator that changes the pattern. Rather than taking one shot, I can take three, four, five shots in in capturing this image. So rather than capturing the the cube with just one shot here, I'm going to take two or three shots to do what the Navy wants. <coughs> in the w in, in the this is a very simple um, um, example of how I can do this if I can. Uh, if I'm interested in periodically sampled spectral bands, suppose I'm interested in it in every fourth band, my coded aperture turns out to be just I get a one, I jump to the fourth line, I get a one, and I so on, I, I, I jump um, four bands, and I multiply that by a random pattern. This code aperture will allow me to do what I'm looking for. So in the first shot, my code aperture is going to be looking. It's going to look like that. My second shot is going to look like that. My third shot is going to look like that, and so on. Right. So in this case, what I, I will be able to do is I will be able to jump every uh, L bands, and I can group those, and I can. Uh, I'm going to be able to reconstruct 
those M bands of interest. And uh, I think that the best way to, to and, and of course I can I can pick any bands that I want. The best way to to do this is as follows. Typical the the previous method. I have my cube. I do my fixed aperture code, one aperture code, and I get my compressive measurement. Everything is embedded there. The only way I can use this data is if I re <coughs> reconstruct the whole thing at once. In this approach, I change my codes, and I take one measurement, I get this data, I get one measurement, and so on. Based on this data, then all I have to do <coughs> is reorganize it such that I can then select the bands that I'm interested. So if I want bands 1, 4, 7, I can easily get them here, reconstruct that. Or if I get, uh, want bands 2, 5, 8, this, will, this information will contain it, and I'll reconstruct that. Now, uh, in general, I can select any bands, and that's the ongoing work that we have now, to not just do periodic bands, but just have arbitrary bands that I'm interested in to reconstruct just those bands. In the work, the reorganization is very simple. If I have, <coughs> uh, suppose I want bands 1, 4, 7, then I just take the first column of the first shot, I take the second column of the second shot, the third of the third shot, and I use that in to build this, this bigger shot. And that will contain bands 1, 4, 7. And, and all you have to do is, is trace how the pixels are sheared in, in spectrum realize that that's, that's what hap what's, what's happening. If I want bands 2, 5, 8, then I take the second column of the first shot, third of the second, fourth of the, of the third, and so on. <coughs> <coughs> and then I can reconstruct. If I just want 1, 4, 7, I can just reconstruct that, um, that bands there. Now, what... Um, I'm going to get, by doing this, I'm going to get much higher signal-to-noise ratio than uh, before. I'm going to be able to use parallel plus processing if I need more than just one set of bands. And uh, I can get spectral selectivity. Right? And I can combine everything if I want the whole cube. But this is just an idea of how, what you get for this multi-shot. This is the original uh, a simulation of the original system. You just take one single shot, you reconstruct the whole cube, and one of those slices of the cube is this. Too much compression, and, and, the, and the end effect is you don't have very good reconstruction. By having multiple shots, you, of course, increase the fidelity. Two shots are going to get much better results. Four gets much better and compared to the original, for instance, you're easily approaching that. Now, eight shot is, is not a whole lot of time. Uh, spatial line modulator changes a thousand times per second. So you can, you can change the pattern very, very quickly. This is if I want uh, selectivity in spectrum. Right? So if you want, um, for instance, A and B are reconstructed from the first group of measurements, bands 1 and 13, and then, then you just split the, the band as, as you want it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this, uh, this part because we're, we don't have a whole lot of time. And let me go now to an extension of compressive sensing uh, that is called low rank anomaly uh, recovery. So <coughs> in, um, suppose we have the video now, right? Suppose we have um, the spectral video that's coming in. So you have a camera, and uh, you're taking this, 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 this uh, uh, FPA is taking measurements at a video rate, which, which you can do. And uh, you're doing uh, surveillance, so you, in surveillance, you're looking for things that, that are of interest, so things that change. So if you have put a scene, something that's going to be of interest if something changes, you know, something that walks in the door and something... That's something that's of interest. That's a surveillance problem. So in surveillance, what we're looking for is uh, to distinguish um, 
objects that may be moving from stationary. And it turns out that the stationary corresponds to the low rank contribution of video. So this whole video surveillance can be casted into a matrix, uh, low, uh, low rank matrix recovery. And let me show you what, what I mean in more detail. <coughs> What we will do is, is something very interesting. It's, it's an, um, an area that has uh, extended compressive sensing. In compressive sensing, we were looking at measuring this uh, signal by its projections, and we measure B. And then we're trying to reconstruct X by just doing this minimization, right? Uh, the way we do this is we do the relaxation and we're just doing this optimization problem where we're, we have this AX equal to B and we're minimizing the L1 norm. <coughs> well, in low rank recovery, we have matrices rather than vectors. So, in matrices, we have a matrix, a very big matrix that's low rank, has two components something that is low rank, L, and something that's sparse, something that's moving. And there's an analogy, because here you're minimizing the x0 norm, here you're minimizing the rank. So rather than minimizing L1 or L1 or L0, we're minimizing rank. In compressive sensing, we, instead of minimizing L0, we went to minimize L1, because it's easier to do it mathematically. Well, here it turns out that the nuclear norm is easier to minimize than the rank. So minimizing the nuclear norm, which is the sum of the um, Again, values or independent components is um, is, equi is equivalent to minimizing the rank of the of the matrix. So this is the problem. <coughs> Here we have a video surveillance problem, and we have these cubes, or we have image cubes. So the data is n1 by n2 by k. This is the x dimension, y dimension, and the spectral dimension. So every time we observe, we observe not just a two-dimensional video, but we have two-dimensional and spectral at the same time. Uh, the scene is supposed to be composed of a stationary background and an event changing in time. So this is the cube, something that's stationary and that's something that changes in time. And we're looking and we're measuring CASI compressed spectral video. So these are my measurements. I go from 1 to n. And my goal is to recover the anomalies occurring on both in time and spectra from this CASI, or multispectral video measurement. <coughs> the way to do that is very, very interesting. You get this, two, this shot, this uh, CASI shot, this spectral imaging shot, and I rearrange it into its vectorial form, a very long vector. I take the next video frame, and I arrange it into a very long and so on. So I, from the video, I create a very big matrix, just a very big matrix. <coughs> and then I want to decompose this big matrix into a low rank and a sparse moving uh, component. Right, and I do the principal component pursuit. I minimize the nuclear norm of that of that uh, of the low rank component and the sparse, the L1 of the of the uh, sparse moving. And this is an optimization problem that um, has been well developed by this fellow Candace and, and, and the like. <coughs> In our case, it turns out that we, what we're going to recover is the anomalies that are in time and spectra. And this is just one way of, of separating time and in, 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 uh, regions where um, uh, well, the reason I'm doing this is because when I separate the two, then the low rank and the and the sparse, uh, the sparse sort of uh, disturbs my coded aperture. So I need to recover my coded aperture from that, that separation, and that's a map that does that. I'll show you in the images what what I mean by that. And then I just do this optimization problem to do the to do the to do the recovery. <coughs> okay, now this is the tricky part because uh, let me see if uh, I don't know. Cost us. So 
So the first video is going to be, and, 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 and just to make things simple, we're going to have uh, RGB. So this is three spectral bands. Right? So this is, uh, <coughs> this is, the, this is the, the surveillance, right? This is the this folks coming in and out of the room. And that has, you know, you're going to arrange that into each frame is one lone vector. And then you, let me do it again. Right, these are multiple, multiple frames. Each frame, I'm going to reorder into a very long vector. And then frame by frame, I concatenate that into a very big matrix. And then I'm going to separate this into a very I mean, low rank and a sparse component matrix. So they're gonna, I'm gonna split, split, each frame is going to be split into two separate components. Right? So this is what you see. That's the original, right? This is so, sort of like the cube. That's what I see. It's three bands, three channels, RGB, and special dimension, right? There. This is what I measure. This is. Those are the guys coming in. These are coded. You see all of those little noise type things? Is a coded aperture. See, I'm not measuring RGB or color image. I'm, I'm measuring this represents the whole cube. Of course, you know, the, the real application is not RGB, but this is, you know, many, many bands in the mid-infrared and infrared and different bands of maybe of interest in the application. But this is a good way to explain these things. So based on this, how do I, how do I recover it? How do I reco recover that, and how do I split things up? So let me go to the next video here. OK. If I do that optimization, this is how my background looks like. You see, the, guy, the, guns, the guys that move are sort of gone. There's some strange little thing that appears here, but that's a, that's the shadow, and it doesn't move that fast. And like it considers it like a low rank. You see, then this is this is the the sparse component. You see how clearly it's it's, it's split. It? It's just a low rank minimization. This plus this was that the previous image. Uh, the measurement image, right? And look how 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 beautifully it 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 just splits it. Yeah. I don't know if I can. Yeah, those are the two. Just adding them up, then you get the other one. Right? But look at this. This here is coded aperture. That has the shape of the guy that's moving the anomaly. But it has the spectra. This has the spectra component, like in spectral information. So my interest is not only getting the, you know, the uh, what it looks li like the shadow of it. I'm interested in getting the real spectral information. So this is when we do the optimization. I do the inverse compressed sensing, or I reconstruct the compressed sensing information. This is the the red. Component of, of yeah, we say how about the other video from from this from the previous image that I just showed you I can recover the red component I can recover the RGB component separately and then I can I can then reconstruct the uh, the, the real color of the of the of the anomaly so this has all the comp all the RGB components, and in general, I will have all the spectral components. Um, and there's some there's some uh, things to be improved, and that's something we're working on. You see, some of this uh, has a little sort of like a shadow on, on the edges, and that's some of the things that, that we're trying to to get rid of it on the optimization problem. But you get the idea. It's a ver very beautiful. You have single shots. Do these spatial measurements that you're capturing a cube. From the cube, you can split the anomalies. And from those anomalies, I can reconstruct the 
spectral cubes of the anomalies. It's a very, very interesting uh, application of, of this low rank minimization. Okay, so in uh, in summary, what uh, what uh, we w we've talked today is uh, a very very fast overview of compressive sensing. It uh, it has uh, numerous numerous applications. Uh, compressive sensing, uh, for instance, is, has has found its way in commercial MRIs. Uh, there's a very nicely uh, fit between the, the physical nature of MRIs and compressive sensing reconstruction uh, is being uh, explored in, in numerous fields, uh, imaging, and, uh, uh, MRI, and astronomy, and many, many other areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very beautiful, mathematically beautiful area. Uh, I described a little bit about my work on spectral imaging of what uh, our project consists and how we can use low rank uh, recovery in, uh, in this particular application of spectral imaging. Uh, what's interesting is uh, low rank recovery is uh, it's a little broader, it's a little broader than, uh, than uh, compressive sensing because it's, uh, it talks, deals with matrices. And matrices have applications in many, many, many areas. <coughs> One typical uh, application that is mentioned in the literature that's very interesting is the uh, the Netflix problem. Do you guys know what Netflix is? Do you have that? No? Uh, Netflix is a uh, movie rental uh, website in the U.S. where you can uh, you can rent movies. And before you rent a movie you have you can see the reviewers. So you may have ten reviewers uh, and those reviewers are going to tell you, oh, I like this movie, it's great. And he's going to say, oh, I didn't like this movie, etc. But not all reviewers review all movies. So if you think of a matrix, if you look at the reviewers in one axis, and then the movie is on the other axis, these reviewers are going to have entries on some of these movies, but not all. So this matrix is going to be very sparse. You're going to have some reviews say a good review is a 10, a bad review is a 0. So you're going to have a matrix that is very sparse between 0 and 10, with entries between 0 and 10. With this theory, <coughs> if the net conditions are met, it can predict what the reviewer would have ranked a given movie that he hadn't ranked. It's very powerful. It's very interesting. Right? Or if you look at the new Ping social network, uh, Apple has a new social network where you have your circle of friends, and your circle of friends puts the kind of music that they like. Right? And but if if you have songs that they, you can think of in a matrix, and you have your friends, your so songs, and they like some songs, and, and some of them are not listed there. Well, you have a sparse matrix. Well, this thing will tell you exactly if a friend will like the mu music or not, even though he hasn't said anything about that. So, and applications like that are very, very many. And it's a very interesting uh, emerging field of uh, sort of signal processing or, or applied mathematics. Well, with that, I, I want to thank everybody. And uh, uh, is, that, is, that, is that how do you say it? Uh, and uh, I don't know if you have any questions that uh, I may be able to respond to. Yes. That's a tough one because all the all the applications that I'm aware of, they always have some sparsity. They always have some structure. Of course, the ones that are noises, that's no sparsity, right? No, no structure. 
But if you look at every, everything else, uh, speech, uh, music, uh, everything has, has sparsity. The issue is how sparse it is in, in, in the in, in acquisition, to me, the most challenging way, the most challenging thing, if you're going to do capture with compressive sensing, is the physical nature of doing the projections. If you can't do the projections, then even if it's sparse, you, know, you have a problem. Imagery is, is well amenable. Uh, communication signals, you, know, you have, you may have a problem. How are you going to do the random projection? Uh, there are some work that people have started to do on doing uh, a surfic acoustic uh, wave devices that do random projections on microwave uh, signals. But that's a very specialized microwave signal. You know, another, I think that's, that's, the, that's the most challenging thing. Yeah. Uh, that's an area I'm interested in looking at because, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, the retina, one of the things that they they use in in looking at diseases of, of the eye uh, is um, uh, the oxy oxygenation in, in the retina, and they use uh, spectral imaging for that. But uh, to my knowledge, they haven't done. Uh, Compressive sensing imagery in, on that application. That's something that would be interesting. Yes. Yes. Right. Well, the algorithm will, will, will separate things that are stationary or low rank from sparse. And if you think, if you look at the, the, uh, the video application, if, you're, if you have anything that's moving, it will capture that. It will separate it. So certainly the, the, the speed is embedded in there. Right? So uh, uh, is, uh, the only problem is if you, if you have something that's moving very slowly moves very, very slowly, then that it, the algorithm may start confusing a little bit. Like you saw in the shadow, you know, in, in the stationary part, you have a little bit of a shadow because it's not, it wasn't moving too fast. Uh. Okay. Yeah. 
there's um, uh, there are other approaches to, to to surveillance, like you mentioned. Uh, in uh, for instance, uh, this there was an application they do did they did without the spectral imaging, just just normal scenery, and uh, depending on the uh, Light conditions, the lighting, light, lighting can change. <coughs> and those things tend to appear in the sub in the subtraction, whereas in this it, it captures it that it, it is a, it is a background. So it seems to be it seems to give better results using this method, although the other ones are are pretty uh, competitive. But this is very simple. This is very very simple. That's the beauty of this. And I think in a lot of the other problems, uh, computer vision type approaches, they tend, tend to be complicated. Uh, optimize, I'm sorry? No, this. Uh, the, the, what is nice is that there's very. There's no 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 parameter tuning. It just you know it it, it, it minimizes the rank. It captures the, the the low rank matrix and everything else is is changing. So there's no tuning parameters. So it's very nice. The computational complexity can be a problem. I mean, you have a video signal of, of minutes, or then you have your matrix becomes very 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 big. There is there is an issue of computation, but uh, I think uh, w that's one of the things that are very active now is how to uh, make this optimization, this convex optimization, minimization, or nuclear norm minimization, faster. Much like in compressive sensing, the original algorithms of compressive sensing would take uh, you know, an hour to do a, a reconstruction. And then the, a lot of effort was put into increasing the speed of the reconstruction algorithm to, to things that we can do in seconds. But the same evolution is happening in, in rank minimization, where the rank minimization optimization is becoming much faster. OK, well, thank, thank you, everybody.